Well, I, I am literally fired up you're here this weekend. I think it's gonna be an incredible weekend, and I wanna say a special welcome to those of you that are maybe brand new to CCV, maybe you're just here checking things out, and we hope you have just an unbelievable experience with us, and I hope you'll come back. Uh, we've been in a series for the past few weeks on the life of Joseph, and we're just looking at his life through the lens of detours, these these seasons in our life where we get off the path that, that we really intended and we're trying to get our life back to where we want it to go. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about one aspect of detours and that is when you feel completely stuck. When you're on a detour and there's no movement at all and it's just painful. Um, I, I, I would bet most of us can relate with being in your car and driving and because of an accident or some sort of construction, you get rerouted on some sort of detour or alternative route and that's painful enough as it is, but for me, as long as there's just a little bit of movement, even if it's 15 miles an hour, I can keep my cool, like I, I'm okay. Now, self-admittedly, I am that guy that even um, when it's only going 15 miles per hour, like there's two lanes, I will switch lanes just if one's going two miles an hour like faster. Like I'm that guy, anybody else that guy? Like I just, I, I just wanna get in the quickest lane. And it drives my wife nuts. She gets so frustrated. She's like, why don't you just relax? That lane's not even going that much faster. I'm like, you need to relax, okay? <laughs> um, how are they ever gonna, how's that lane gonna see my CCV sticker if I don't get over in that lane? and then get back and show somebody else. So, you know, and plus, look, we got in this lane, we're two cars ahead where we were at, you know? I mean, I just, I just know myself. I just, I just, I, that's just how I, I do it. But when I lose it is when everything comes to a complete halt. Like traffic is completely stopped, there's no movement at all. And that's when I just start going, going nuts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking all around, I'm like, why are we stopped? What is going on? I'm telling Jamie and the kids, hey, get out of the car, go look and see what's going on, you know? <laughs> like, Dad, is that safe? I'm like, just, we're stopped, just get out of the car, just look. Like, I just know myself, I have to have movement. I want movement. And when things stop and I feel stuck, it's like I need to know why am I stuck. And my guess is today, that's how some of you feel on the detour you're on right now. You feel stuck, whether that's you know, feeling stuck in a marriage or with a divorce that just recently happened or is, or is a lingering effect or maybe it's a career issue going on or maybe it's an addiction that keeps popping up. Maybe it's just your energy level that you just, you just feel stuck every single morning waking up, like what's going on and your mental health just continues to struggle. Now there are many reasons why you can get stuck on a detour. Like you, you, just, you just stop having forward movement. What, what I'm gonna talk to you about today is the number one reason people get stuck and do not see movement past a detour. And I wanna warn you up front, it's not popular, what we're gonna talk about today. But I don't feel like my job as your pastor is to be popular. I feel like my job is to teach you God's word and let the power of God's word transform our lives. And the topic we're talking about today, I know of nothing that has more power to help you move past a detour than this. And so here's the summary of everything we're gonna talk about today, just in case I bore you and you fall asleep, all right? Here's the summary. Nothing will halt your movement past a detour more than what? Unforgiveness, unforgiveness. Why is that true? Because what we all know intuitively is when you're on a detour, almost always there's either someone that is partly or partially at fault for the reason you're on the detour. Someone's, someone's hurt you. In other words, there's a face and a name associated with your detour, even if, even if that face is the face that you wake up and look at in the mirror every single day. Because oftentimes the person who's hardest to forgive is actually you. But no matter what hurt you've experienced, there's always a dilemma. Do we hold on to unforgiveness or do we, do we forgive? And I want you to know on this topic today, the closer the relationship you have with someone that's hurt you, the harder it is to often forgive. And in scripture, I don't know of anyone outside of Jesus that had a more ironclad case for why they shouldn't have to forgive than Joseph. 
I mean, let's just think about his story, which we've been walking through the last few weeks. Um, Joseph's mom, believe it or not, actually dies when he's really, really young. So he loses his mom, raised as a single dad family. His dad raises him in a very dysfunctional household. His brothers hate him all throughout his childhood. They hate him to death to the point where they betray him, throw him in a pit, and actually they're thinking about killing him, but instead, you know, thankfully, you know, thank you brothers, they sell him into human trafficking ring. That's what they, for 20 pieces of silver, that's what they do. And if Joseph, on this detour, on this path, is eventually wrongfully thrown into prison, and, and you can just picture in your mind Joseph sitting in a dark prison cell with rats running all around him and just shackled, and it's just nasty, and he's just running over in his mind all the hurt he's been through and all the revenge he should take. But in a twist of fate, Joseph gets out of prison because he's the only one that can interpret Pharaoh's dreams, the most important and powerful man in the world at the time. And Joseph interprets his, Pharaoh's dreams and says, Pharaoh, seven years from now, there's gonna be a famine. And the famine, if you don't prepare for the next seven years for it, it's gonna wipe out and kill so many people. And Pharaoh likes Joseph's interpretation so much and his advice that Pharaoh promotes Joseph in a split second to the second most powerful man in the world because he controls all the grain distribution, all the food distribution for the whole entire world at that time because as he's gonna prepare. And in, in this moment, as Joseph gets promoted, the famine hits. He's so powerful. It's been 20 years since he's begged for his life from his brothers and they betray him. And 20 years later, guess who shows up at his office doorstep begging for food because they're starving? Those evil, horrific brothers of him that betrayed him. I mean, this sets up like a movie, like an unbelievable movie where a character like Denzel Washington or Liam Neeson just exacts revenge, right? And what we're gonna see today is Joseph uses a different playbook. And it's a playbook that allows you to move past being stuck on a detour to running towards your destiny again. Let's pick up the story in Genesis chapter 42, verse six, it says this. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold the grain to all its people. He is the most powerful person in the land at that time. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And you're thinking like, dang straight, you better bow down, you punks, you know? But what's so interesting is as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized him, but he pretended to be a stranger and he spoke harshly to them. You can just see the anger that's been building for 20 years almost coming out at Joseph as he just unleashes on his brothers. But the most interesting thing is this, watch verse eight. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. Now, why would Joseph recognize them and they didn't recognize Joseph? It's very simple, at this point, Joseph is completely Egyptian. Remember, he's, he's a leader in the Egyptian kingdom, so he actually speaks the Egypt, Egyptian language, he talks like an Egyptian, he dresses like an Egyptian, he walks like an Egyptian, right? I mean, <laughs> Joseph's Egyptian, and, and in, and in this, this day and time, the Egyptians, what we know is they would have been very clean shaven, where you know, Hebrews would have had a lot of hair and you know, bur- beards, um, Joseph would have been completely clean shaven, maybe like think Mark Moore, bald, right? Um, you know, like that. And so he, and, and he actually even uses an interpreter with his brothers because he's speaking Egyptian and an interpreter's uh, and translating to his brothers. So they don't recognize him. But what happens next is Joseph remembers his dream. Remember Genesis chapter 37, Joseph's dream when he was 17 years old is that his brothers would all bow down to him. And you're thinking, that just happened, they just bowed down to him. And on surface level, it looks like that happened, but it actually didn't because in Joseph's dream, there were 11 brothers bowing down to him. And in this moment, there's only 10 brothers bowing down to him. Why? Because Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother, got left at home. He's dad's new favorite since dad thinks Joseph is dead. And so Benjamin didn't come with them. So what Joseph does next is he immediately accuses his brothers of, of being spies, which would be a capital offense. He could have put them to death right then. But instead, he then throws him in prison for three days. I think Joseph maybe wanted his brothers to feel what it felt like to be wrongfully put in prison in a deep, dark cell. But then I think Joseph remembers his dad, which he still loves very much, and his brother, Benjamin, who was an innocent brother. And he thinks about them, and he thinks, well, if I don't send these brothers back with with the food that they came here for, my dad and brother Benjamin will die, because that's how bad the famine was. So Joseph gets an idea, he says, I'm gonna allow the brothers to go back 
to their homeland to go back to my dad and brother, but he tells the brothers on one condition, you have to leave one of you here in jail. And the only way you can get this person out is when you get back home, you better bring Benjamin back so all 11 brothers are here. And they agree, and in front of all of his brothers, Joseph bounds his brother Simeon and throws him in prison. And as his brothers are walking out, Joseph overhears something and he, and he does this. He turned away from them and he began to weep. It's as if all this 20 years of pent up pain and hurt, Joseph begins to process it. The brothers leave, they go home and they, they show up to dad and they say, dad, we got good news. Good news, we got food, we're gonna live. But the bad news is we had to leave Simeon in jail and the only way we can get him out of prison is if we bring Benjamin back. And literally, you can go read it for yourself, the dad looks at his brothers and goes, sucks to be Simeon, because we're not sending Benjamin back, literally. And here's what they did, for the next two years, they ate all the food Joseph gave them while Simeon's rotting in prison. You thought your family was dysfunctional. I mean, this is like messed up, right? But eventually the food runs out. That's how bad the famine is. And the only choice Joseph dad has is to send all the brothers back, including Benjamin, or they will all die. So the brothers go back to Joseph, trembling in fear because it's been two years. I mean, is Joseph just gonna kill them on the spot? And when they show up, watch what happens. All 11 brothers are there. They bow down before him to the ground. Joseph's dream is fulfilled. It's fulfilled. And at this, Joseph takes out his sword, looks at his brothers and, say, and says, say hello to my little friend, and he chops them to pieces, <laughs> like a John Wick novel, you know, just cuts them to pieces, you know. I'm just kidding, that's not what happened at all, right? But isn't that kind of what we want? Wouldn't that feel like kind of gratifying? I mean, this is like all the movies we love, right? What does Joseph do? Watch his response for a second time. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother when he sees his brothers for the very first time, and he sees Benjamin, jo Joseph hurries out, looks for a place to weep there. He went into his private room and he just begins to weep. He begins to weep. He begins to process through the pain. And then Joseph wipes his tears away, pulls himself together because he hasn't revealed himself to his brothers yet, and he goes out to his brothers and he allows them to go home with the food, but he, he's messing with them, he tests them. As he's sending them away, Joseph takes his silver cup, which would have been a, a massive status symbol and a, a, a very expensive thing, a, a status symbol of power. He takes his silver cup and he hides it in Benjamin's bag and he sends them away. And then as they're leaving Egypt, Joseph sends a servant out and the servants walk up to Joseph's brothers and they say, you wicked, evil men. How could you steal from my master when he has done so much for you to save your lives? And the brothers are taken back. They're like, we didn't steal anything. In fact, if any of us is caught stealing anything from your master, that person will die and all of us will become your slaves. The servants say, sure enough, search the bags. They search the bags and, and of course they find the silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And Joseph's brothers tear their clothes in grief because they know it's over. They go back to Joseph trembling, knowing that they're maybe gonna die or be slaves for the rest of their lives. And Joseph looks at them and says, no, 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 not all of you are in trouble, just Benjamin, just the one caught with a silver cup. And then in a, in a twist of fate, I want you to, to log this in your memory because it's something you can gloss past in the story of Joseph. We're gonna come back to it at the end of the message. Benjamin deserves to die. And Judah, one of Joseph's brothers, who's not even the oldest brother, raises his hand and Judah says, I will take the place of Benjamin, my life for his life. And at this moment, Joseph can't take it anymore. It says this, Genesis 45, one, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all, all his attendants, and he cried out, everyone leave the room, except for his brothers. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers for the very first time, and then Joseph wept so loudly, the Egyptians heard him throughout the whole entire household. That's how loud he's, he's just weeping. Third time we see him weep. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they'd done so, he said, it's me, it's your brother Joseph, who begged for his life when you betrayed me. It's me, the one you sold into Egypt. 
But then watch the faith of Joseph. Watch this, watch what he says. And now don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. And then Joseph says this, so then it was not you who sent me here, but who? But God. And in this moment, Joseph utterly and completely forgives his brothers. He forgives the unforgivable. How do you do it? I mean, if you wanna develop the ability to forgive others when it seems like what they've done is unforgivable, how do you forgive? Because in my estimation, in all of scripture outside of Jesus, this is the greatest act of forgiveness we see in scripture. I wanna show you three things straight from scripture I think Joseph did that allowed him to forgive that will allow you to develop the ability to forgive others. Here's number one, and it's a little surprising, but we've seen it three times. Joseph wept. Joseph wept, what, what, what do I mean? What I mean is he allowed himself to process and grieve what he had lost. And in my estimation, this is one of the greatest gaps people have with forgiving, is they never process truly what someone's taken from them and really what they've done to them. People just don't do this. What, what do we do typically when someone hurts us? We just gloss past it, we run past the pain and hurt and act like we're stronger than that. What do we do? Someone hurts us and all of a sudden we say something like this, oh, it doesn't bother me. Someone walks up and says, yeah, but what they did, I mean, they really hurt you, like they abused you, they, they betrayed you, they ruined your reputation. No, not me, it didn't bother me. Strong, right here, you know? I'm too strong for that. Like seriously? Oh, it doesn't bother me. Kind of seems like it's bothering you a little bit, you know? I mean, it's like we try to act so macho. Joseph does not do this. He doesn't pretend. He processes the grief and the hurt. He weeps. He weeps so loud that the whole entire household heard him. And I want to talk to men for just a minute because I think there's so many men you've been taught that real men don't cry. And that's kind of your mantra. And yet here we have one of the most godly men in scripture weeping. Jesus himself wept. So if you think real men don't cry, you may need a different model of what manhood really looks like. Now, that being said, let's, let's, let's talk truthfully. Watching a man just walk around crying all the time, that's annoying. That's just flat out annoying, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm mean, talking about a woman walking around crying all the time. That's annoying, all right? But what I'm saying is, isn't there a time and a place where you've been hurt to a place where you need to process that grief to the point where you may need to, even in private or however you do it, you, you may need to shed some tears to process what's been happening. Stop trying to act so macho. Acting like what someone did doesn't bother you is counterproductive. You wanna know why? Let me give you an image. When you act like it doesn't bother you at all and you just try to move on, you take a serpent and you stick it in your soul. And what happens is that serpent, at the most inopportune times, unleashes poison outside of you on everyone around you. And some of you are so triggered, you're so angry all the time, and you don't even know why. You see bitterness boil out of you. Your wife, your friends, why are you so mad? And the reason why you need to understand is that anger and bitterness are always a secondary emotion. They're a secondary emotion. There's something underneath anger always. And what is almost always underneath anger or you spewing out anger and bitterness is almost always unforgiveness. There's someone you haven't forgiven. And that's why it's so important that you process what you've lost and that you grieve some. And I think it's important for you to actually make a list of what someone took from you. Literally take out a piece of paper or your phone, write their name and say, what did they take from me? What would have been on Joseph's list? Well, on Joseph's list, what did his brothers take from him? They took his childhood. They took his innocence. They took his peace. I mean, they took the ability when Joseph turned 18 to go to college and meet some hot Hebrew girls, right? I mean, I don't know what would be on his, I mean, there, there's a lot of things on his list that his brothers owe him back, right? Have you ever really processed what someone took from you? Or are you just kind of at a high level going like, it doesn't bother me? Joseph wept. 
That's number one. The first step in I think forgiveness is for you to write down and grieve what, what you've lost. Have you ever done that truly, truly? Here's the second thing Joseph does. Joseph focused on the good, not just the bad. Remember, right after he forgives his brothers, he says, hey, hey, there's been good that's come from this. There is. He didn't allow himself to be overwhelmed by the bad that had come. He also focused on the good. And later on in Genesis chapter 50, we'll see Joseph look at his brothers and say, what you intended for evil, God used for good. And Joseph was just foreshadowing what Paul would tell us in Romans 8, 28 later on. Then we know that in all things, the hurt you have right now, all things God does what? Works for the good for those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. Are you just focusing on just the bad that's come from what someone did hurting you? Or have you really focused also on some of the good that's come out of it? It's what we've been talking about throughout this whole series. Here's the third thing Joseph does to forgive, and this is the kicker for some of you. Joseph didn't rely on an apology from his brothers before he forgave them. I have searched the study of uh, the, the story of Joseph front and back so many times, and I will tell you this: there's not one place in Scripture we see Joseph's brothers apologizing to him for all that they did. In fact, it's almost the exact opposite. When Joseph finally like speaks to his brothers and weeps over them and forgives them, did you know it says they can't even utter a word to him? They don't even speak to him. And then later when they finally do speak, it says this is the first time they speak to Joseph. In Genesis 45, 15, it says, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And what is it, what, what's his brother's response? He's, he's like, I forgive you, it's okay, I, I, I love you. You think they, they'd say, we're so sorry. What'd they do? Talk to him. Literally, you could look up this Hebrew word. It is a word with no emotion, no remorse. We don't have one example of Joseph's brothers saying they're sorry. And I think what keeps so many people, and maybe this is you, from forgiving someone else is you're still waiting for them to come to apologize to you before you forgive them. And this brings up a few misperceptions we have about forgiveness that I wanna just talk to you about today, and I hope this helps someone. I'm gonna talk to you about five things forgiveness is not, is not. Here's number one. Forgiveness is not dependent on the offender saying I'm sorry. It's not. And some of you are thinking this, why would I say sorry to someone or, or forgive someone who hasn't said sorry to me? Why would I do that? That's stupid. Let me tell you why. Holding on to unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Let me say that again for someone. You're holding on to unforgiveness as a power play until they say they're sorry and you are drinking poison and rotting yourself from the inside out while they just go along their merry way. You don't wait for someone to say they're sorry. Now does that help? Of course it does in the process of forgiveness, but someone needs to hear this today. The person that hurt you may never say they're sorry in your life. They may never. In my life, the, the person I've had the hardest time forgiving that I've had to forgive is someone who has never said they're sorry, never repented. My wife, Jamie, yeah, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, it's not, it's not Jamie at all. She's great at saying sorry, but it was someone else in my life that when Jamie and I were first married, I held on to unforgiveness, and I'm telling you, it rotted our marriage at the beginning, and it was on me, because I was holding on to unforgiveness. Here's the second thing forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not saying what someone did is okay. When Joseph's brothers came to him, do you think Joseph was like, hey guys, remember when you threw me in a pit? I begged for my life, you're gonna kill me, but then you sold me to a, a you know, child you know, trafficking ring for 20 pieces of silver? No big deal, guys. Of course he didn't say that. When you forgive someone, you're not saying what they did is okay, ever. Here's the third thing forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not the same as trust. Forgiveness and trust are two completely different things. Forgiveness can be instantaneous. Trust oftentimes, when it's broken, has to be rebuilt over time. And people mess this up all the time. They think, well, if I forgive someone, I now have to trust them. No, you don't. Now, the goal is eventually, hopefully, reconciliation and trust again, especially if it's a relationship where someone's broken your trust, but that trust may take some time. 
And I wanna speak to someone here today, there's, there's someone here that you've experienced sexual abuse or physical abuse, I want you to know you may forgive someone, never trust them, or spend a moment in their presence ever again in your life, and you can still forgive them. You don't have to trust them. People mess up forgiveness and trust all the time, it's one of the biggest mistakes. Here's the fourth thing forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a decision. So many people think, well, I'll, I'll forgive them when I feel like it. You think Joseph felt like forgiving his brothers? No, his immediate reaction was to throw them into prison, to speak harshly to them. But what Joseph eventually realized is that if he didn't forgive, he was the one putting himself in a prison. And if you wait to forgive someone till you feel like it, you'll be waiting until Jesus comes back. You will. And here's the secret with forgiveness. Please hear this. Positive feelings tend to follow after forgiveness. They don't typically come before it. You won't feel like forgiving someone. It is a decision you make, and after you've made the decision, the peace of God will come over you, and then you'll start to feel some of those positive feelings. Here's number five. Forgiveness is not forgetting. You may forgive someone, and it doesn't mean you're gonna forget what they did immediately, and you think, well, if I, if I still think about it, I haven't forgiven them, no. You may forgive, do you think Joseph, when he forgave his brothers, like never thought about what they did again? I mean, they're living in Egypt now, he gives them a home, he takes care of them. I bet you he saw them oftentimes and it conjured up memories in his mind. He might have had to forgive them over and over and over again. That's what forgiveness is not, and I hope someone, that helps you today. But if that's what forgiveness is not, what is forgiveness? What is it? Forgiveness is linked in scripture as a financial term. This is so helpful. It's a financial term. And I'll show you the perfect example. Most of us, even if you're not you know, a church person that much, you know about the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus talks about forgiveness and watch how he talks about it. Just let this sink into your heart. Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our what? Debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus is using financial language because in scripture, the word forgiveness is almost linked, almost always linked as a financial type um, concept because here's what it means to forgive. Biblically, it means to release freely. It means to let go of what someone owes you, no different than if someone owed you a financial debt and you wiped it and said, you don't owe me anymore. That's literally what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is literally this. It is actually saying to someone, I let you go, I no longer demand, demand payment from what you owe me. Now, here's the million dollar question. How can you forgive someone truly if you don't really know what they owe you? This is why making a list and really documenting, here's what they took from me, here's what they owe me, is so powerful. You have to know what someone owes you, not just say, I forgive them at a super high level. No, sometimes that's why you don't feel like you've forgiven someone, is you've never done the hard work of saying, what do they owe me? And so you have to take out a piece of paper, I'm gonna challenge you to do this today, take out a piece of paper or take your phone out and put their name at the top and just say, what do they owe me? What do they take from me? Can I tell you a few things that might show up on your list? For someone, they took your childhood. What they did, they took your childhood and what you wanted. They took your innocence. Someone took your trust in men or authority and you've been struggling with it ever since. Someone, they took your reputation. Maybe someone took your friendship, and they owe you that back because they ruined a friendship. Maybe they took your peace. What did someone take from you that they owe you? If the first step in forgiveness is to make that list and say what someone owes you, the second step is very simple. It's to release what someone owes you. So you don't owe me anymore. So powerful. And you know when you do this, you know what's amazing? Oftentimes you'll find that what someone owes you, they couldn't even give you if they wanted to. Someone owes you your childhood, how are they supposed to give you that back? They can't, so you don't owe me anymore. I forgive you for my own sake, 
not for even for years. I forgive you because I will not drink the poison of unforgiveness to get myself stuck in life forever. And you're in my innocence, I wipe it. You don't owe me anymore. You can't even give it to me. Your trust in men and authority, my reputation, that friendship. Could they help with some of those things? Maybe, but the reputation, maybe, maybe the damage may be done, the friendship may be done. Your peace, they can't give you back your peace. Your peace comes from God, not from another person. So you make a list and you release them for your good so you're not rotting inside. That is so easy to say and yet so hard to do, isn't it? And that's why today I want you to just hear the real life story of someone from CCV that's had to wrestle with forgiving. I want you to listen to what it's done in her life. Watch this. The emotional gap of being a single parent when everything falls on your shoulder and your whole world is falling apart. You don't have a husband to turn to, to love you, to help you, to encourage you. And you just feel like you felt your kids. I was 19. And um, I was dating somebody and I was living with them. I had an apartment. And I had made a conscious decision that I wanted to, I wanted to have a baby. I wanted to have someone that was gonna love me and that would never leave. So I made that decision, you know, not realizing the scope of the consequences. She decided for us and for our safety that it'd be best that like we, we, we kind of got out of that situation and she moved in with my grandma and he decided that he was gonna leave and he took off and now we have no idea where he's at, whether he's alive or dead or in jail, we, we don't know. I didn't want my son to grow up with that kind of a male role model. Um, so I made a conscious decision to raise Josh on my own and we struggled minimum wage jobs, barely making it. It was really hard. Josh got into sports when he was four, started playing soccer, started playing baseball, and the hard questions came, you know, where's my dad? Why is this dad show up for games and I don't have one there? And up until that point, I didn't really question it. I didn't know that I was any different, honestly. I thought that it was just Disease is how life was, you know? Some people had one parent, some people had both. At the end of the day, I was so still kind of like insecure about, you know, myself and who I was and that I didn't have a dad around. And it started to lead me to, to, to be a little spiteful and a little angry with, with the situation and the cards that I was dealt. But it's like, how can you like have a kid and like not know or not care to know where he's at or how he's doing? You know, I blame, I was so angry on him and, and not forgiving him and blaming him for those things that I was justifying the actions that I was going through these other years by, you know, other failed relationships or finding unhealthy outlets, you know, which we all do when we're going through those times and we're trying to find anything to just fill that void. We do so much on the regular, I feel like, to hurt God. We hurt his feelings, we sin, we do things to offend. Um, we're constantly making the wrong decisions, and yet he still loves us, and he forgives us daily, every single day. And it's if he can love us and love me enough to forgive me for the mistakes that I've made that haven't just hurt myself, but I've hurt innocent people, I've hurt my children, um, then the least I can do is forgive him and hope that he finds forgiveness somewhere down the road. My mom has forgiven people that have done brutal things to her. And I think that's why she's so confident in herself though. I think she's the one that taught me how to forgive. She's someone that taught me how to love. She taught me how to really be a child of God. Forgiveness gave me the freedom. I feel like truly gave me the freedom to just be fresh and be renewed and be restored. And, and you know, it's never a perfect day. It's not, life is never perfect, but I think we, I deal with things a lot differently now, you know, through doing forgiveness first.
I think it allows me to deal with things head on and deal with things in a lot more compassionate, loving manner. And allows me to just be able to, like I said, actively participate in the healing process. I want to thank, uh, thank Tanya for sharing your story. It's, it's really, really powerful. And what some of you are thinking, though, is that's a really nice story. But I don't think I'm going to do it. I mean, why, why should I have to forgive? You don't even know what they did to me, Ashley. I mean, if, if you knew, I, I, I like holding on to this thing, unforgiveness. I like the bitterness. I think it gives me an edge, really. I bet the people around you don't feel that way. Why should you have to forgive? There is a very simple reason if you're a follower of Jesus here today. Here's why. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We forgive because we've first been forgiven when we didn't deserve it at all by Jesus. Did you know there's the only part of the Lord's Prayer Jesus comments on afterwards? The only part is forgiveness. Right after Jesus says the Lord's Prayer and he says, you, you, you better forgive those around you. The same way you've been forgiven, Jesus then says this, he clarifies, he says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But let this sink in today. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's how serious God is about us forgiving other people. See, forgiveness is a beautiful word when you need it. We sometimes think it's an ugly word when we have to give it. And I think we need to flip the script and realize that one of the most powerful things you will ever do in life is to forgive someone else, to release the bitterness and the pain and the poison that you put in your heart. And listen, you may have to forgive over and over and over again the same exact way God forgives you over and over again when you mess up. Did you know that's one reason we take communion every single week at CCV? It's so that we can be reminded over and over again that God went to such great lengths to make a way for us to be forgiven, to send his son Jesus to, to die the most brutal death possible so that we could be forgiven. And the most amazing part, potentially, of the whole entire Joseph story to me, you remember when Benjamin gets caught with a silver cup? And he deserves to die, and Judah raises his hand, and Judah goes, I'll take his place, take me instead of him. Why Judah? I mean, of all the brothers, why Judah? He wasn't the oldest, he wasn't even the second oldest, why'd he step forward? It's because, did you know the story of Joseph is simply a foreshadowing of who Jesus is? Out of all 12 brothers, which brother did Jesus come through that brother's lineage? Judah. Jesus is the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah. Jesus is our example. When he forgave us everything you've done, we're called to forgive others. And if Jesus made a way for us to be forgiven, maybe we need to make a way to forgive others. We're not gonna take communion right now. I'm gonna wait till the very end of the message to give you some instructions on that. I'm gonna come out, but I wanna give you one song right now called Jesus Made A Way. And I want you to just, some of you, while, while the band comes to sing this song, I want you to just ask one question. And here's the one question I want you to ask. While we sing this song, is there anyone, anyone that comes to your mind that you need to forgive? Just listen to God, let's sing together. The 
You can have a seat on all of our campuses. Did God bring anyone to your mind, even if it was a fleeting thought of someone you still need to forgive? Even someone you thought you'd already forgiven. Could be a mom or dad, could be a family member, or aunt, uncle, could be a friend, a coworker, someone you haven't seen in a really long time. The person you may need to forgive is actually you. You haven't even brought yourself to forgive yourself, and yet if Jesus forgave you, (laughs) why wouldn't you forgive yourself? I will tell you this though, for some of you, the reason it's so hard for you to forgive is you've never accepted the forgiveness of Jesus. You've never gone all in and been baptized. And it's so hard to give something you've never received yourself. Have you received that forgiveness? But for all of us today, if you feel stuck on a detour, you feel stuck, I want you to know you cannot move past 
what you will not forgive. You'll feel stuck for the rest of your life. And forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it will transform your future. And so I wanna pray right now for anyone here that needs to forgive. And here's my challenge to you. When I get done praying, you can stay in your seats and and take communion right now, but I'm gonna challenge many of you, do not take communion today. Take it home with you. Take a piece of paper, take your phone out, you make that list of what someone owes you, and then you go through a process of just saying, I wipe it clean, you don't owe me that anymore, then you take communion. Because remember what's at stake, if we won't forgive others, how can we expect God's forgiveness in our life? You need to know that what someone did to you to hurt you does not have to be the most defining moment of your life. The most defining moment of your life can be your reaction to what someone did, and that reaction always needs to be forgiveness. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for just you leading the way and forgiving us when we didn't even deserve it. And God, because we've been forgiven, we know we're commanded to forgive other people, as hard as that may seem, but would someone today realize that holding on to unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die, and Father, you wanna free us. You want us to step forward towards our destiny, but we'll never be able to do that holding on to unforgiveness from something done to us. So today, I pray for someone to to take that communion cup and go home and have a, a moment, a defining moment in their life where they forgive someone. And when they do, God, would you transform their life like we know you do every time we forgive. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Have an amazing weekend, CCV. Love you very much.